Welcome to Pratidwani, where we try to humanize science. I'm your host, G.V. Pawan Kumar. It is my delight, honor, and absolute pleasure to have my friend and uh, my colleague, Professor Umakant Rapol. Welcome to Pratidwani, Umakant. Thank you, Pawan. Thank you very much for inviting me on this channel. So, Umakant, uh, as probably many of you may know, he is uh, an experimental physicist par excellence and has done some very interesting work in related to atomic physics and quantum optics and he has also done some fantastic work uh, related to uh, quantum uh, information related optical phenomena where he uses cold atoms and uh, off late also coupling them to plasmonic systems to look at some very interesting uh, kind of ventures. So, uh, Umakan, uh, one of the aspects uh, related to uh, your, your work is that uh, you have a great training in experimental physics. Uh, I would want to really understand and know more how at all you became an experimentalist. What was the grounding you got? So tell us right from your foundations, from your from your childhood, where were you born? What was the kind of exposure you had? Yeah, etc. I think I have to go back really way back in time to answer your question. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the interest in experimental sciences, although I didn't know it was about it was this experimental science when I was in school, it was it started basically in school, mm -hmm. the interest towards uh, experimental science. I was uh, obviously always like any uh, child was very curious about different phenomena that's going around me. And to tell you frankly, my interests initially were not directly in physics mm -hmm. or any associated areas. My interests were more in biology when I was very small. Interesting. So, the biggest question that used to uh, keep bothering me and it still bothers me is what is life? How, we, how does life come to existence and what is death? What happens after death to the organisms? What suddenly happens that they just uh, uh, one day stop acting the way and stop behaving, acting or living the way they are. So, uh, like to try to in trying to understand this obviously these were uh, questions which for which answers were not available in textbooks and all that so i used to go to our school library which uh, fortunately used to keep some advanced uh, textbooks mm. uh, at a college level and even uh, at a post graduation level and try to go through them and see how the human body and other organisms are built and mm. uh, how they are formed but uh, I was never satisfied with whatever I could, I mean, at that stage, whatever I could uh, understand from reading those, I could grasp, but it was really not uh, mm -hmm. possible to understand everything. Of course, this curiosity, as I keep gr kept growing up, then I came to the, somehow an understanding that, okay, life and everything that goes around us is based upon certain foundational principles of uh, physics mm. okay i didn't know it was at ph or physics at that point again it was about uh, at the level of the smallest particle that one mankind can think of of which things are built bottoms, bottoms. up mm. like atoms molecules and all this this was very complicated at that time but still it was this curiosity about uh, knowing what happens at the atomic scale of course i didn't go i didn't think beyond the at i mean Mm -hmm. below the atom I would say in the sense of well, just under, thought that okay it's only these atoms which are the most fundamental particles at that time and then how these come together and form molecules and then things start building up. So that's how this uh, curiosity started. Then I as I kept growing up then I started uh, getting interested in machines and mm -hmm. mechanics basically mm -hmm. and how uh, different things work the way they work like I mean, all these automobiles and mm. bicycles and other things, how they are constructed, how they are built. And uh, that uh, that was a very curious phase. And I used to go to school and come back to school. I used to, at some point, go to school by just walking because our school mm. was quite close by a few kilometers. So we used to go by mm. walk and come back by walk. And on the way, I used to stop by the, these big garages, which used to open up truck <laughs> engines and other engines. and uh, they used to uh, fix 
thing uh, these vehicles right so I, as i used to cross i used to spend uh, one or two hours just standing there and staring at the innards of these machines how they were trying to understand how these work so and, what time what place tell us that so uh, the, all this i would say up to something like fifth or sixth standard now in the uh, years uh, years 19 it, okay so i joined school in 1979 when i was 5 years old yes. and then this was between uh, roughly 83 84 82 to 85 kind 1982 to 85 right. kind of time period then another the thing, place place it, this was in solapur solapur so, where okay. i was born that's where you were born yeah. right in solapur yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah so another thing that uh, used to drew, um, ignite my curiosity was that my father was quite interested in many many different types of uh, areas like mm. uh, he used to he was though he was a ayurvedic doctor by profession mm. he was quite interested in things like photography he was interested in uh, uh, breaking and fixing watches radios and everything so he had his own uh, kind of a little workshop at home where he used to experiment with lot of things so there i had really an opportunity to play with all the things and break things most of most of the times and and 90% of the times the things that used to open and try to fix would never get fixed and mm-hmm. things used to fail mm-hmm. including one of my wrist watches which i had opened and tried to fix no j- just to try to see what's going on inside i opened it and could never fix it mm-hmm. and it went uh, bad <laughs> so that's how this was in that period then now uh, since uh, my father used to play uh, play with lot of electronic stuff he at some point he somehow from his friends or through some books he gained the knowledge about the workings of this valve radios those days and he used to actually fix lot of uh, radios of his friends and relatives and mm-hmm. i used to stand next to him looking at what's going on and at some point as i started understanding more in the sense of uh, uh, i mean as i kept growing when i was in class 7 during the vacation mm-hmm. period mm-hmm. he decided to teach me what he knew about radio so in the summer vacation i actually learned lot of electronics from him the first thing i learned from him was about how to read the values of resistors yes, yes, which are yes. color coded mm-hmm. starting from that and the functioning of vacuum tubes and all he taught me during that summer period mm-hmm. and actually he made me build a valve radio completely from scratch nice. during nice. the summer time and how to tune it and all that so this is how my mm-hmm. school life basically went on then after that now this was the time where I, my interest suddenly changed from Uh, biology physics to electronics electronics yes ah, although i was interested in uh, mm-hmm. physics but electronics drew my attention a lot during this period and then uh, i got interested in uh, i mean I, the interest moved from this bulky valve radios to small tiny transistor radios mm-hmm. those days of course even now i'm interested in uh, watching cricket mm-hmm. the interest has reduced now but those days it used to be a, a big deal to kind of concentrate and on the radio and listen to the commentary oh, of the matches yeah. of, that were going on that was the only source of getting information about cricket those mm-hmm. days mm-hmm. so one of my <clears throat> uh, i don't know craze was to have a small transistor radio carry it in my school bag and go to school and wa- hear to the commentary mm-hmm. during the uh, during the break break or something but then these transistor radios were too bulky then i started uh, doing some uh, uh, so called research at that time into whether these transistors come in very small uh, sizes then of course there were a lot of electronics uh, circuit books at home i kept digging them and asking my father how whether one can uh, build a radio with very few components okay. and then i came across this single transistor single diode kind of uh, radio receivers which can operate with just one pencil cell and tried to build this at home and of course uh, because of uh, bad tuning and bad choice of uh, the uh, lc tank circuit some of these uh, radios used to pick up all kinds of crazy mm. radio stations mm. from very far off distances this was operating in medium wave 
which used to pick up uh, radios from I don't know Bangladesh radios mm -hmm. and radio mm -hmm. and all kinds mm -hmm. of things that used to pick up. But it was extremely exciting to hear something, something. that's uh, something from that tiny little circuit. <laughs> so that's how my interests kind of slowly started growing. And of course, uh, this curiosity of uh, all the phenomena that is going around you, like the phenomena from light, mm. phenomena from um, uh, just simple things like um, uh, everyday observations of water boiling mm. and some things get fa hot faster, some things uh, not only uh, it takes time for them to get hotter, but they also take time to get colder. Mm. Mm. All these concepts of heat capacity, concepts of diffraction, interference, all I kind of uh, kept seeing them on a daily basis and then I was craving for that day when I would really learn this at a much deeper, deeper. depth and see how these things, uh, I mean, to basically understand the workings of everything. That was the whole thing. Fabulous. It was a curiosity. Fabulous, fabulous. So it also means that uh, you had a kind of a, an encouraging atmosphere at your home because mm -hmm. your father was also very... Yeah, so it was quite encouraging and uh, not only was it electronics, it was also true with photography. Mm, mm, yeah, so he had interests in multiple areas. So mm. one day while coming home, he had uh, he had bought a truck along with him, which was full of equipment from a photo studio, which he <laughs> bought it on, bought on the way. Wow. So he came home with <laughs> all the amazing. all the photography equipment and uh, uh, dark room equipment and everything. Uh, okay. And uh, we basically, I mean, he set up a dark room at home. So that's when I again got interested in this uh, photography thing. Mm -hmm. Not only about just photography, but the entire process of photography up to developing the prints. So that also I learned in school, school. at home. So. Yeah, it was quite uh, interesting. That's very uh, kind of fascinating, Mukat. Because uh, as I see, uh, and having interacted with you and having seen a lot of your work, there's a quite a lot of electronics you use. And uh, one of the kind of, you know, signatures of doing very sophisticated controls uh, of a lot of things, what we do in optics mm. and also in other uh, mm. uh, peripheral areas, has to do with uh, interfacing your uh, machines through electronics. And uh, you also have been teaching electronics mm. uh, to our students mm. uh, in, in ISAT Pune. This kind of exposure at an early age to these kind of things are very important, right? Because yeah. if you want to really do something, that's a very yeah. crucial exposure. Exposure and, uh, I mean, uh, basically the curiosity and exposure when they come together, you basically get, uh, uh, you underst start understanding things at a much deeper level and when you try to utilize this for your professional life, in your professional life, like what I do now, mm. many of the things that uh, actually work and help is through intuition. So you don't have to go through a lot of details about analysis, analyzing things in a deep, mm. sophisticated mathematical manner to actually come up with a solution. But uh, just because of intuition, you kind of already uh, zero in down to certain set of parameters or configuration, which actually lets you come to a solution in a much quicker way. Of course, one has to do deep analysis mm -hmm. and all that as and when needed. But for many of the things, time is an essence. So this uh, coming up with a solution through a intuition helps a lot in terms of uh, saving a lot of time. Yeah, and that intuition is generally also built on the fact that uh, you would have already tested and gone in depth in the past at some point. At some yeah. point, yeah. So you will probably carry over that knowledge and then implement it yeah. in, in your work. So that's actually an mm -hmm. important part of how experiments are also done, because at the every moment and for every experiment you have to reset. Mm -hmm. Unlike let's say code code writing or unlike let's say uh, when you are postulating a theory, you can already assume something and then start. Mm -hmm. In experiments, even if you are doing something, right. Even to do a control experiment, you have to have everything set to zero right. and yeah. then you have to get started. Right. Right. That's a, one of the fundamental differences, right, in mm. experimental physics and also, let's say, theoretical and yeah. computational physics. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, mm. So, yeah. if you look at 
per se the training what generally one gets and i i assume uh, solapur also had good schools in the place where yeah you... so i mean our school was uh, quite good i would say if i even compare it with current standards because mm, mm. Uh, they used to uh, teachers used to encourage this uh, curiosity driven approach Apple. towards mm, things mm. and also the college where i went after my schooling uh, it had some very good teachers mm. and our laboratories were equipped quite well for mm. such a mm. small place we had and many number of experiments and we used to get opportunity to work on these experiments even uh, after our lab timings mm. Mm. and uh, yeah so teachers were quite good when and the facilities that were there were very good at that time i, I would say even if i compare it with uh, the current uh, state of the art i would say at that time this my college had very good facilities for doing things very interesting. more than that the teachers were quite encouraging mm -hmm. to do so yeah yeah that's a very crucial aspect whenever mm -hmm. one is trying to actually learn yeah that you need to have some encouraging environment mm -hmm. so uh, at that particular time were you already thinking of becoming a scientist or physicist or something related to science i know that you are already developing interest in electronics and yeah that. so <clears throat> i mean i i didn't know at an early age what i would become but mm -hmm. uh, i clearly knew that i should go in a direction which will allow me to explore things and learn things so i didn't want to i never had a dream of going a job going to a job where i do something from 9 to 5 forget about mm. it earn the salary and come home i always wanted to do something where uh, this in desire of curiosity mm. is always fulfilled so i ended up in the right profession mm. but however my father at some point after 10th or 11th he said i think uh, you should go and do a phd and become a scientist wow he already told yeah that. he told me that but at that time his dream was that he, he was an ayurvedic uh, doctor so mm. he had a lot of interest in chemistry also mm. he thought i should go into doing chemistry phd which uh, somehow it didn't happen but uh, yeah for me i was driven more by physics and electronics at that time yeah. fabulous fabulous uh, so which also means that now you also mentioned that you went to a college which had a very good kind of uh, experimental hmm. uh, foundation right. which which laid for you uh, what were that kind of topics what you were studying in uh, in co college like you were taking a conventional pcm or uh, you finished your school 10th standard and then went to college right so one of the things uh, that uh, i always uh, repented in when i was in 11th and 12th standard was that uh, i had got uh, not so great marks in mm. my 10th standard and uh, i wanted to take electronics in class 11th and 12th mm. Mm. i could not get electronics in class 11th and 12th because of the marks problem so i obviously continued with the physics and other subjects mm. which have which come along with that after 12th standard i got an opportunity to not only do uh, choose physics but also electronics so i started with physics chemistry mathematics and electronics and then proceeded to finish uh, bsc in physics okay okay yeah but uh, other thing i should mention that in class 11th and 12th although until class 10 i used to like mathematics to a great extent but class 11th and 12th i never liked mathematics only for one single reason because mm. mathematics was not taught mm. to the extent that you students can at that age can understand it well because new concepts like uh, limits calculus and calculus which basically comes in it's very hard to uh, grasp this subject at class 11th and 12th okay of course you can always um, um, by heart the formulas and learn the tricks to solve problems which many of the students used to do but the actual meaning of calculus and how calculus has to be used where it is useful this these questions the question of where this calculus will be useful always bothered me because nobody taught us the real concepts of the 
of these limits, continuity, mm. derivatives, integration mm -hmm. at that point. So I really lagged behind in mathematics in class 11th and 12th. The only time I started really liking mathematics is from first uh, standard and uh, first uh, uh, BSc. BSc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's when there was enough time to not get into the rat race in 11th and 12th where students were just running after scoring marks and writing competitive exams. But in, when I came to BSc, I got a breathing space because there was no hurry for anything. There was no competition or rat race. So I took my own time to understand, discuss with teachers the meanings of meanings of all this calculus and everything. And then I started really appreciating mathematics and its usefulness in physics at that point. So, yeah. This is fabulous. fabulous. Yeah. Because see, I totally agree with you on that particular point. I had very similar experience. Mm. Uh, means uh, I had uh, reasonable teachers during mm. that time, but uh, I, I did not enjoy studying uh, 10th and 11th standard period, mm. not yeah. just mathematics, yes, yes. even the physics and other things. Because there's too much of pressure in just cracking some exam. Mm. And uh, somehow the realization of these subjects that they are interesting and can be connected to real world, that gets really dawned upon you only when you sit down without mm. any push and pressure. Yeah. And uh, I had very similar experience. When I went to BSc, I really started, especially, uh, in fact, uh, so much so that I, at some point of time, mathematics was, was one of my main subjects. Mm. Because in, uh, in Bangalore University, the, you can actually always take physics, mathematics mm. and uh, any other stream. So, uh, this is a very crucial thing what you are mm. mentioning because uh, for to becoming an experimental mm. physicist, there is a necessity of having good knowledge of mathematics. Yes. Sometimes people don't realize that. Uh, although the way in which mathematical physics is generally portrayed, it is as though that it will be only useful to theoretical physics, generally speaking, many yeah. a times. But we also use quite a lot of mathematical physics. Which means also you get to see that aspect very, very clearly as you progress. Right. And mm -hmm. being an experimental physicist, when you see uh, mathematics, ex uh, I mean, uh, mathematical methods in physics, yeah. which is taught in a more abstracted manner, becomes difficult to kind of uh, connect it to the real problems. Yeah, no problem. But once I started understanding mm -hmm. the connection to real life problems in physics, then I started enjoying the mathematics that we require as physicists. Absolutely correct. Absolutely. Yeah. See, for a case in point, for example, Fourier, Fourier domain. Yes, uh, Fourier analysis, transforms. That is one of the most important transforms yes. you, you'll study. Ipsop. If you uh, right, because if you look at conventional courses in uh, in mathematical physics, they generally don't emphasize that much. But uh, majority of the stuff what you do, even in uh, let's say condensed matter physics, you mm. go to the case space. Yes. You will all. It's essentially taking a Fourier transform yes. per se. So, in that sense, did you also have good teachers during your college where, who were uh, very... Yeah, uh, so very teachers good. were always good even in 11th and 12th mm -hmm. standard. The, some of them were the same teachers who taught in BSc. Mm -hmm. But the problem is in 11th and 12th standard, there is too much crowd. There is too much pressure to finish things in time. Mm -hmm. And everybody is uh, not really uh, trying to learn much in college. They, they were trying to learn everything cracking mm -hmm. the exams through tuition cl coaching classes and all that although the number of coaching classes those days was much smaller what? than <laughs> what you <laughs> see now way way Even, smaller uh, and in our town it's a relatively smaller city in maharashtra so there it was less in spite of that there used to you could see this atmosphere of competition and cracking exams that time so th those two years just flew like that without any yeah, it's called anything learned that borderline time. torture, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, because I, I have seen so many people losing interest yeah. in doing uh, anything related to technical or science, mm. although it might propel them to become doctors and engineers, right. but you would have beaten all the interest out of them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, it is kind of a wondrous thing that people still retain <laughs> after that. The yeah. other aspect uh, Uma, uh, I wanted to ask is that you uh, you continue to do BSc. Uh. Um, you know, at the time and uh, place where you are studying, was there not pressure to get into medicine or uh, or uh, engineering for you? Did they not uh, push you at your home? No, as I said, my father 
had a determination that I should become, I should do a PhD and become nice. a scientist. Nice. So because of that, there were no such pressures. Pressure. Nice. So I kind of knew that okay, after BSc, one can do MSc and then a PhD mm -hmm. to some extent. So that way, I I was not under pressure to kind of go into engineering or uh, medicine. So that was never a question. My only uh, worry in class 11th and 12th was not to fail, <laughs> just to get, <laughs> just through, get it, through it, get through it and then learn things properly later. So that was the... Tell, tell me a little bit about your father uh, because uh, he, it, it sounds that he has a very different viewpoint. A person who has deep interest in photography, deep interest in actually it's kind of scientific looking uh, outlook. Uh, what kind of uh, interaction you had with him? Was yeah. it very, uh, was it very cordial in terms of let's say even interaction of uh, of exchange of ideas, or he left him uh, you to whatever you want to do or something like that? No. So when it came to I mean about all this science hmm. and all anything about scientific things, hmm. we had a very good friendly relationship. So he was always uh, used to always encourage me to uh, read things, do things. Since he himself was uh, by training an Ayurvedic mm. doctor, he mm. had a huge library of all kinds of uh, books in Sanskrit mm. and Telugu mm. on Ayurveda and everything. And I used to there used to be also literature in Hindi. Mm. So I used to pick them up and read many times. And when it came to things like uh, I mean, electronics and mechanics and all that. Since he himself used to do a lot of things at home, I used to participate together with him in whatever he used to do. So I used to help him, I used I to do things for him and we used to do together things. So it was uh, that kind of a relationship. So Very for instance, at one point he picked up a hobby of uh, um, uh, buying completely broken mopeds or two wheelers <laughs> and completely refurbish them on his own at home uh, open the engines change wow. the piston rings everything change the bearings and overhaul the complete engine get the body repainted and use it for a year and sell it off and buy another one and do like that uh, repeat the thing Things. so i used to participate in that so that helped me understanding the mechanics of engines and other things how they work and things like that. So, now, now I see where it comes from because <laughs> I should mention to the to the listeners that Umakant is is extremely hands on. In fact, one of the very very versatile kind of you know uh, experimentalist uh, that is very much part of a, a culture, right? Because uh, if you do not have that exposure of uh, thinking through hands, mm -hmm. I'm using these words very carefully. Thinking through hands, because uh, of course. If one does, let's say, something a little bit more analytical, you will think on paper, hmm. which is another important part. But there is also a lot of things what you do in physics where you you have to move objects. Hmm. By moving objects, you will you will get new questions, and that new questions can lead you to new answers, and those answers will further lead to new questions. Yeah, and also when you are um, when as an experimentalist, you are actually um, manipulating physical systems and understanding how they behave what is their response and especially when in my field when you are working with manipulating atoms mm. and trying to understand certain phenomena you need to really uh, get into the atoms in the sense yes. you have to uh, completely immerse yourself into that particular phenomena and try to understand what is going on and if something is not uh, behaving the way you mm. want then unless when you are immersed into it then you can come up with solutions to the problem at hand and get them behave the way you want especially when you are trying to use these atomic systems mm -hmm. or uh, photonic systems you may say for for applications mm. and at the same time when you are trying to kind of um, establish analog systems for certain physical phenomena 
which occur in other types of uh, systems like in condensed matter systems. If you want to replicate those phenomena in using atomic systems, which is what half of our research is about, mm -hmm. doing simulations of real life systems mm -hmm. using atoms, atoms yeah. which is you're not doing a computational simulation, but you are actually doing yeah, a simulation it's, it's, with uh, with real, real objects. That, in fact, we'll come to that particular yeah. point. That's a very fabulous aspect of yeah. simulation. Because many a times people who know about science don't know that you can also create model systems in experiments. Uh, because this is very, very important way of looking at nature, mm. uh, where you emulate things in laboratory, which can mimic, let's say, an electronic property or something Correct. Like that. So one uh, good example about that, which I learned from my guru at PhD was that uh, this double pendulum, coupled double mm. pendulum. It is an analog of all the two level systems where you see rabbi, rabbi oscillations. Mm -hmm. You can imagine them in, uh, you can see them with this analog system of coupled pendula, which is of course a classical system, but the physics that comes out of this coupled pendula is similar to what you see in a two level, driven yeah. two level yeah. system. Yeah. yeah. That's a very, very interesting because um, we'll come to that particular point mm. when we go a little bit more deeper into the work, yeah. what you'll be doing. Uh, now, going in the chronological line, whatever we are discussing, mm. now that you are uh, doing your uh, plus two, you mm. finish your plus two, in BSc, where do you do? Where, where did you do? Uh, so, 12th, up, uh, 11th, 12th and BSc, I did it in the same college. Same college. Mm -hmm. In Solapur, it's, uh, uh, it's a college of DAV institutions, mm -hmm. DB of oh. Dayanand College of Arts and Science. Yeah, yeah. even in Pune, it is, it yeah, is yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. a very famous yeah. uh, institution. Yeah. yeah. So that's where I did mm -hmm. all the five years I spent there nice. from 11 to two. BSc. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So then, uh, 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 what is the kind of uh, exposure you had apart from science? Did you also do anything there? Did you have any extracurriculars and other things there at that particular institution? No, not in the college, mm -hmm. but uh, outside the college. I mean, I I spent. Well, I mean, uh, during those days, I learned an important thing in my life and that was swimming. Nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, my father was very protective about me during school days, not mm. to let go close to water. Mm. But at some point, he realized that swimming is a very important uh, <laughs> no, thing skill. that one skill, that life skill that one should know. That was one thing that I learned. And of course, see, another thing I went, I did was... Uh, I joined martial arts for about four years. Nice, nice. So I went very close to black belt, but I didn't uh, complete because by that time I had to move the city and join my post graduation. So it got broken right, there. Right. Yeah, that was very interesting. Unfortunately, I mean, for a, uh, since childhood, I liked one instrument, and I have never learned to play it. But I am this, I am thinking of learning that instrument, and that's a piano. Ah, nice. You yeah, should. You I should. love <laughs> that instrument, but uh, it, I think at, at some point I should start yeah. to learn that. It, it's never too late to learn something. So no, I should mention <laughs> that you know Umakant also comes from a family which has many artists. We'll come to that particular point where they also have very talented uh, mm -hmm. in terms of also design and other things too. His own daughters are really, mm -hmm. really very, very fantastic artists, I must say. So Uma, then you move from uh, Solapur. Pune, is it? Pune. So, no, actually, I uh, immediately after I finished my BSc, I continued in the same university. So, that, mm. those days, the colleges in Sholapur were uh, affiliated to Shiva, uh, Shivaji University in Kolhapur. Mm. So, I wanted to go to, my dream was to come to Pune University, mm. but their admission started, start, used to start a bit late. Mm. So, and they also had an entrance exam, which I had written. So since the results had not come <coughs> yet, I joined the Shivaji University in Kolhapur. Then within two weeks, I got the result from Pune University. Then I immediately joined Pune University and came to Pune University. And then oh. my world of uh, possibilities opened oh. up when I joined the Pune University. Yeah. Because of just the environment and the kind of facilities they used to have those days and excellent teachers and researchers that they used to have at that point. I, yeah, I joined the university 
after that yeah we'll come to that particular point mm. because uh, uh pune university physics department actually has had very rich history mm. dating back to 1950s and uh, even today they actually are one of the the best uh, departments across the country in the terms of state universities mm. so in uh, what was the kind of uh, stuff you did during that time uh, can you paint as a picture of how was the how was the, your experience of doing masters msc in physics in pune university uh, you know there were stalwarts people we have read textbooks <laughs> written by people yeah i mean it was an inter- it was an yeah. interesting and exciting period yeah. in the university uh-huh. uh obviously all the teachers that who taught us were uh, fantastic mm. remarkable teachers as you said mm. some of them wrote books mm. and all that uh it was a tough time to to uh, cra- uh, to pass exams that time mm. those days mm. because mm. of course the level the standard of the teachers was extremely high mm. they used to we used to be taught like most universities i suppose from the bibles in the <laughs> physics, physics books like jd jackson, jackson for electrodynamics yes, yes. which is obviously an overdose for a student who is coming fresh to university yes. otherwise i would have i i kn- knew about griffith's Gr- electrodynamics much later, later but we started learning yes, from jd jackson yes, yes. you can imagine the difference, difference. in these two books uh, although uh, jd jackson covers everything whatever mm-hmm. you can imagine in electrodynamics mm-hmm. but the language and the level at which it is covered is a bit incomprehensible at that age unless you are really really smart in understanding things and work out the problems mm-hmm. those kind of lev- that kind of level this teacher used to teach us and of course we used to have for the first time in my life i experienced this tutorial sessions problem solving sessions mm-hmm. in the university which kind of uh, made us understand the subjects much better, much better than just learning theory and writing theory in exams so this was the first time that i encountered this not only me many of my uh, classmates went through difficult time during those days to actually it was exciting it, uh, you learned a lot of new things of course at a very mm. sophisticated and high level but we <laughs> sailed yeah, through <laughs> but i must say that the exp- the experiments uh, the exposure to experimental science in the university was at a completely different level yeah, right. because at those days the university the department used to have at least in the indian scenario some of the best labs, labs and yeah. uh, facilities that one can imagine and uh, the biggest uh, uh, privilege i would say i should still i still remember that I, i mean because of which i have an experimental physicist mm-hmm. because of which i am where i am reach where i have reached mm-hmm. is because of one of the professors with whom i did my uh, masters project so it was professor dharmadikari dharmadikari cv cv uh, dharmadikari cv dharmadikari yes. popularly and uh, <laughs> lovingly known as cv cvd <laughs> so he had for the first time and uh, for the first time in the country had actually indigenously built a scanning tunneling microscope and he was building an atomic force microscope those days it was just about i would say within 10 years of the nobel prize mm. for that technique and it was remarkable building things absolutely uh, with right. everything that's available locally and designing things from scratch starting from vibration isolation to um building the cantilevers and tips and all the data acquisition system and everything it was fantastic that lab experience was fantastic yeah i should mention to the listeners that uh, professor cvd was uh, our colleague here at isf pune too yes he has also played a very critical role in establishing our uh, undergraduate experiment mm-hmm. uh, laboratories and we have all learned a lot from mm-hmm. uh, by interacting with yeah. him he you know shoulder to shoulder we have wrapped it <laughs> and uh, we have learned how to teach <laughs> laboratories uh, in fact yeah. he you can see that that enthusiasm mm. is still there mm. and uh, i i can also readily see that how, how he has influenced you people right mm. right at the very uh, kind of young age where you are mm. getting exposed to this uh, this remarkable culture uh, is something which sometimes is lacking in uh, in uh, places where uh, you don't have uh, 
experimental facilities sometimes. Uh, so how do you really go about uh, thinking about uh, people who are doing uh, experimental facilities and uh, what kind of uh, infrastructure uh, these uh, MSc level uh, infrastructure requires? Yeah, I mean, uh, talking about the facilities uh, that are required at the master's level, I think uh, it is obviously important and a must to have very good experimental facilities. One of the things that uh, we come across when we, during the transition from bachelor's to master's is uh, exposure to quantum physics, mm -hmm. which is a completely, a complete paradigm shift in our uh, understanding in a completely different uh, um, way of thinking or looking at physics. We start, uh, only then we start learning physics that happened in 20th, 20th century. century yes. And some of these concepts to begin with are very hard to uh, grasp. It is similar to grasping calculus at 11th standard, mm. which is a completely new uh, beyond algebra, something new that you learn. And if it is not, not only should it be taught well, but you should also experience the concepts mm. that are taught in this so-called modern physics, which contains uh, all these atomic phenomena, the quantum physics, or the Bohr uh, hydrogen atom model and everything. So it is very important that many experiments should be there which cover these concepts apart from the standard classical mechanics and electrodynamics experiments and some of the solid state physics experiments which again are connected to quantum physics it is very important to have a good chunk of experiments mm -hmm. uh, which give you the experience of the outcomes of quantum physics i think that is something very important, important. yeah, yeah right. that needs to be there yeah, uh, did you also have optics in there uh, during your MSc? Did you do any uh, optics experiments? Because yeah. I know there is a lot of interesting condensed matter uh, stuff which happens there. I remember. I don't remember uh, optics. I remember only from my BSc days. A mm -hmm. lot of different types of interference and diffraction mm -hmm. experiments, mm -hmm. which we did during our uh, BSc days. All kind. I mean, I can name readily at least seven, eight mm -hmm. kinds of uh, interference and diffraction experiments which we did with optics uh, in, in optics domain. In masters, I readily do not remember what uh, optics experiments we did. Yeah, yeah. I don't really yeah. yeah. because uh, see one of the things uh, in your own work, which we are going to also discuss mm -hmm. a little bit later, the kind of stuff what you did do in your lab is also very interesting in terms of, you know, setting up uh, you know, quantum optics experiment mm. requires quite a lot of mm. uh, knowledge about how to, you know, uh, navigate some of the mm. light beams and other things. Uh, that training also comes very, very early during your, your, your work. In fact, all of us who have done experimental optics uh, will have to really be trained on table, mm. otherwise it will be very difficult. Right. And this early exposure to MSc level experiments is, is mm. very important. Yeah. One, on, one more point I want to uh, kind of, uh, you know, ask you is that <coughs> the, I also know a lot of your friends, uh, mm. who, you know, common mm. friends mm. who have also been graduated mm. uh, from this same department MSc, mm. including our own colleagues, uh, Shiva Patel, mm. Collins, Suhita, mm. and uh, uh, Sushil Mujumdar, mm. and uh, Sunil Nair, of course, mm. and uh, so many of them, you know, everyone actually is excellent physicist who is mm. doing or a bi biophysicist or <laughs> biologist mm. nowadays mm. what is there what is the air what is in the air <laughs> in that particular department which has given rise to not only this and this give, taking a very small set so a small subset and of course it includes you also what is that Umakan? so many people i've seen that that particular timeline there are so many good people who have become good scientists there should be something which is very, very good about that, right? Yes. I mean, I would summarize it in these words. I would say that all of us were put through a grind of critical thinking mm -hmm. and uh, uh, rigorous. Arduous, rigorous thinking and mm -hmm. being a hard worker. Mm -hmm. I think that was what 
uh, I would say, describe the department those days. Putting you through a rigorous really? grind of try understanding things, not just mug up, mug up things, but understanding things and uh, come up with solutions and whatever. I think that was the... The fundamental... Yeah, difference. that was the difference. Yeah, yeah. because uh, that is also such an important thing. And most of the people whom I just mentioned mm -hmm. are all experimentalists. Mm -hmm. Right? It is yeah. also quite remarkable. You know, mm -hmm. see, I also have a lot of friends from my own BSc mm -hmm. and MSc days, uh, especially during the MSc days. Most of them are theoreticians. Mm -hmm. okay, I also come from state, state university. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the AMOP. You know, that mm -hmm. was my training. That's how I got mm -hmm. connected to Vasant and uh, or knew about mm -hmm. you from, mm -hmm. from uh, Sharat and other things, which we're going to discuss later. But one of the important aspects. Yeah, I, actually, that, before uh, that, I would like to add another point mm -hmm. here is that. Uh, all the teachers who used to teach us, uh, I'm about talking about experimentalists, mm. since this department uh, was, uh, I mean, f was flourishing because of experimental activities, there were many, many labs doing different kinds of uh, uh, excellent experiments. So whoever was little bit inclined towards experiment used to get an opportunity to directly work in the research labs. Nice. So most of our uh, master's projects used to happen in the research labs. It was not just an isolated uh, um, project, but it used to happen in research labs. And that time used to give us an opportunity to actually uh, think, think in the way scientists think and do their things, which is again to a large extent happens at ICER also, where our undergraduate students come to our labs to do their uh, short term projects. I think that is very important, important. integrating research with teaching, that also used to happen quite often quite at the university. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. This is an important point uh, and uh, we will also anyway shift into the research mode. Before that, one final question on the MSc. Uh, how is it, the environment, living there, working there? Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> hey, it, was, it, was fun. it was fun. I used to stay in the hostel. hostel. So, uh, the way I got admission in the university was through some national exam mm. because they used to have a national exam for students coming from other universities. Within Maharashtra? Other all, all over, all over. India, India. Right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. They used to have a, another, they used, just before my batch, they used to have a, a program together with TIF for a joint program of MSc through which they used to take students to this national exam. After, uh, just before my match, before, before my batch, the program stopped, but they continued that program through some other uh, means, through a fellowship from the university or UGC, I don't remember from where. And I came through that entrance exam. So the 10 people who were, who got admission through that program, out of the 80 students, we were 10 of them. We were staying in the hostel together and they were from different corners of the country, from the various corners of the country. And it kind of gave a very cosmopolitan exposure in the way of uh, looking at things and working. So that was quite uh, enjoyable, experience. enjoyable experience, I would say. Yeah, that, that so, creates also a very nice social hmm, kind of structure. Yeah. And I, I have uh, legendary stories I've heard <laughs> on the hostel times and days. <laughs> and that, that we'll probably keep it for another yeah, session yeah. at some point. Yeah. So now, Umakant, uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about your uh, further stint at IASC, mm. where you now move from uh, Pune University. Tell me how the transition happened. What brought you to IASC? Ah, okay. So, yeah, uh, so during my master's, after the first year, since uh, the environment at the university was driven towards attracting anybody to do research in sciences, during the first year vacation time, I learned about, I mean, just before the vacation time, I learned about the summer research programs across the country and one of the very well-known summer research programs was of uh, TIFR, Visiting Students Research Program. So I had applied for that program and I got through 
and I, I felt myself extremely lucky to get into this visiting students research program. So two months of time spent in TIFR gave a further boost to my inquisitiveness into doing pursuing science as a career and doing even more with even more uh, bigger. zeal, mm -hmm. bigger, mm -hmm. I wanted to pursue research. So, whom did you work? Yeah, in yeah. TIFR, I worked with uh, Professor Kuru oh, in Kuru. the mm -hmm. nuclear physics uh, division, mm -hmm. working on uh, doing some uh, spectroscopy measurement of lifetimes of excited states of atoms when they are smashed mm -hmm. into a foil. The at ions were accelerated and smashed into a foil and the electrons go into different excited states and they decay and you measure the light emitted from the atoms as a function of distance and you can decipher the lifetimes of various excited states. It was very fascinating. I worked with a small accelerator. Ah, nice. And nice. Uh, there I interacted and came across many, many different uh, great people in TIFR at that time. And this... Uh, thoughts of pursuing research kind of uh, really buried into me. So in the second year, I decided to do some solid experiments in the university. That's when I came across again Professor Dharmadikari and I worked for my master's project in building the first uh, atomic force microscope in India. Oh, wow. Okay, so uh, okay. of course, my project time was too short for the uh, overall projects period. Hmm. I could only get hands on this trying to design and build cantilevers for the atomic force microscope. Now, as I finished my MSc, of course, I wanted to, uh, somehow I didn't have the capacity to think about going abroad because of our own uh, uh, financial situation mm -hmm. at home and all that. So I never dreamt of going abroad because it would have involved a lot of uh, expenses so I decided to stay within the country and there were only two places where which I thought I should do my PhD I didn't have any other place in mind and these two places were either TIFR or IAS yes, yeah. so I applied to both of these places and uh, I had written gate examination mm. because you had to have some, some national examination yeah. to be qualified for these uh, although not for TIFR but for mm. IAS it was so I wrote that exam I got through and uh, yeah, I continued in IISC. But uh, I must tell one interesting story about myself, uh, about how I ended up uh, in atomic physics, mm. cold atoms physics. So I had worked in the area of scan, uh, tun scanning tunneling microscopy and atomic force microscopy, right? So I wanted to pursue the same area of research. And I thought IISC ha did have a group who was working in this area. I went there for interviews. There were like about six to seven panel members in the interview. Out of all the members, there was, everybody was a very senior, very well-known Indian physicist sitting in the mm -hmm. committee. Who's who? <laughs> uh, who's who, like <laughs> Professor T. V. Ramakrishnan, oh, and wow, okay. Professor Ajay Sood and mm -hmm. many others. Yeah, yeah. There was only one person there who was the youngest person there who was in the committee. And I thought he must have been a postdoc or something in the department <laughs> who is sitting in the interviews. Then what happened was after the interviews got over, uh, there were a bunch of uh, student volunteers, PhD mm. student volunteers from the Department of Physics who were actually telling uh, these uh, students who had come for interview about the department, department, what all work goes on and all that. So, and also they had given us a information sheet about who are the faculty who are taking students and for which areas. Mm -hmm. I initially, I mean, uh, when I looked at the first uh, few of them, I got disappointed because nobody who was, I mean, person who was working in scanning tunneling mm -hmm. microscopy is not taking any students. But then I got suddenly stuck on a particular name and the area of research and that was about uh, a person named Professor Vasan Natarajan who later became my PhD mm -hmm. advisor. I, it was about a completely different type of uh, research area which I had never heard of. I always heard about condensed matter physics and high energy physics mm -hmm. until then. Mm -hmm. But this was about 
actually uh, using light to control the motion of atoms and arresting them in free space and trapping them. Nice. It sounded extremely exciting. Mm. And I, after the interviews got over, of course, I went back home and then mm. just waited for results to come through. And then I got a call letter. Mm. Those days it used to be through telegrams. Telegram. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got very excited. I came, I came along with my father, joined the department. And I went to meet all of these people. Mm. Mm. So there were three, four of them. And uh, I mean, out of the bunch of uh, faculty, I shortlisted two or three of them, including uh, Vasan. I went and met all of these. What year? What year? This was in 1996. 96, 96, 96. I went and met him. And then, I mean, I was just flabbergasted and mm -hmm. completely impressed by his knowledge about physics and the kind of problems he dreamt of doing. Because he had also just joined in January 20, 1996 and this admissions happened in August 1996. Super. So I, myself and one more of my friends, colleague Ayan Banerjee, who is now in ISR Kolkata, Kolkata. Yeah. we both ended up joining him. So he gave a very interesting anecdote about himself when he uh, interviewed me, personal interview ah. <laughs> to figure out whether I'm suitable for experiments or not. So he mentioned his own personal anecdote when he, uh, after he asked me a particular question, the first question he asked me was, can you rip apart a bicycle completely and put it together? Nice. I said, I thought, why is this question here? <laughs> then I told him, yes, I can do yeah. everything. He said, fantastic. Then you should join. Then an, mm. then he told his own story about mm. how he ended up uh, doing PhD with uh, David Pritchard, Pritchard. in MIT. Yeah. So yeah, the listeners should know David Pritchard actually is one of the pioneers uh -huh. and the Nobel laureate. No, he is no, not a Nobel. Uh, Dan Kleppner was. Kleppner was. Uh -huh. But he but worked they with all, him, right? They, were, they all, they all uh, worked together. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, David Pritchard produced a PhD student who became a Nobel, Nobel laureate. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so apparently he, when he <laughs> went to join MIT, uh, so hmm. his professor David Pritchard was hmm. sick. So he went and met him in the hospital apparently. So he asked him the same question. Ah, nice. Whether he can rip apart a bicycle and fit it to put it together. And he was, basically he explained to me what that means in terms of hmm. uh, doing experiments. Nice. And that's when I understood this uh, importance of uh, all this intuition, your skills with hands, uh, your uh, entire the understanding of the mechanics and all, everything comes together, the knowledge of physics, all that comes together and then it basically makes you become a successful nice. experimentalist. Of course, uh, you have to also come up with extremely novel ideas mm. when mm. executing your project. So that's how I ended up in atomic physics, that to cold atoms physics instead of going into condensed matter physics. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Very fascinating story. Uh, you also mentioned about uh, that transition time and the interview. Mm. And uh, how was it? Can you just pay a little more attention to that interview if you remember something? Because you are really you know, talking about some people who are, you know, very, very well-known names in Indian physics community. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, I only remember one question. I don't remember the other questions because uh, quite a few questions were from my own project, project. which I did uh, um, in uh, MSc. And of course, in electrodynamics, it was a hardest subject for us to mm. learn and the question was from electrodynamics <laughs> so the question goes like this there are two electrons which come close to each other and scatter and go off mm. so when they are scattering there is a change in the uh, change in the trajectory right mm. Mm. so momentarily there is acceleration mm. Mm. that time there is emission of radiation, radiation. Yes. Yeah. so the question was which are the lowest multipoles in the emitted 
electromagnetic radiation that would survive so okay nice nice very interesting now i would leave it to the <laughs> listeners to, <laughs> listeners solve, to the problem, solve the problem, the problem. <laughs> but i i uh, i think i solved that problem without getting into mathematics nice nice In, uh, through just the uh, intuition Radiant about uh, nice. emissions from a radiating dipole nice nice very nice so Excellent. that was the only question i remember wonderful wonderful so um that further then let you to uh, a very lifelong association uh, not only with wasan's lab but also your close uh, buddy ayan banerji yes uh, so, yeah and could you tell what were the formative years at iisc and yeah it was uh, i mean of course extremely exciting exciting excitement was uh, from various angles see when uh, when any new faculty joins which mm. i understand now mm. those mm. days i used to not understand <laughs> getting funding is one of the most used to be the most challenging task it still is when you are a new faculty you want to establish a laboratory that is the biggest task that one has to overcome yeah at the same time if you have taken phd students early then it is a much bigger responsibility than just getting funding and doing your research so when wasan took both of us there was hardly any funding in the lab it was a lab which was basically inherited from earlier uh, researchers in iisc working in nonlinear optics mm, mm. and lot of uh, equipment and systems that were used then they were mostly for uh, understanding frequency doubling mechanism four wave mixing mechanism uh photo refractive effect and all these which involved high power lasers but none of those laser systems were suitable for obviously for the kind of experiments that was on that plan to do was on that plan to do start experiments with ultra cold atoms and as the audience may remember in 1995 just a year before there was a nobel prize which was uh, given to eric cornell and um, Wolfgang well, Ketterle yeah. for observing or creating the first Bose-Einstein oh, condensate in the lab, and that was created from techniques from laser cooling and trapping. And incidentally, uh, Eric Cornell, the Nobel laureate, was Wasson's uh, senior so, in the lab, nice. in the yes. same lab, in the same lab. And yeah. uh, he had a very good rapport with him. Mm -hmm. So we initially we didn't have much funding for uh, starting these experiments. so with whatever little contingency money you, he used to get from the institute which is just peanuts mm. to buy pen and paper he used to uh, let us buy lot of electronic components and he used to arrange laser diodes from uh, some funding from here and there and also he used to uh, borrow some some of these diodes from his friend eric cornell and give it to all of us to start building control system controllers and everything for building laser diodes those days laser diode systems tunable laser systems were not commercially available so everybody who used to work in this area had to build their own laser systems in the lab before you could use them to do any physics experiment now in this process couple of years went by without any actually good uh, big funding to the lab mm -hmm. so in like 3 to 4 years there was uh, we got the first funding mm. wasan got the first funding and then we could dream of doing some experiments but however for my phd all the things that i did were completely built by me in the lab for doing those carrying out those experiments but uh, over this entire journey i must say i am probably me and ian were probably one of the very few privileged graduate students with whom the supervisor used to spend day and night in the lab teaching us Easy, yeah. working together with us including cleaning the lab and everything we used to sit together and he he i was very impressed by wasan because he was again one of those kinds who used to do things very intuitively and although he was uh, extremely interested and uh, very good in uh, deep theoretical understanding mm -hmm. also because uh, while he was at mit he studied diverse subjects mm -hmm. like gravitational physics uh, 
statistical mechanics, mm. etc., mm. from the stalwarts in the field, field yeah. including quantum uh, relativistic quantum mechanics and all that. He was very good at working with hands. Mm. Mm. That was partly because he was an electrical engineer mm. by training. Oh, okay, nice. At IIT Madras. So, all those, his qualities kind of mm. uh, culminated. Uh, uh, culminated into me picking up some of those and trying to get these things. I mean, now I, when I look back, I think those were really my uh, golden era in my mm. life where mm. I learned a lot of things and got this energy to build complicated things without really fearing about it. Yeah. No, that's a remarkable thing. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a shame and it's a it's a kind of a real tragedy that uh, Professor Vasant is no more, uh, mm. unfortunately. Mm. And I also uh, anyway will be linking the show notes uh, uh, in the show notes the fantastic obituary you and uh, mm. Ion wrote. Yeah, mostly uh, Ion. Wrote. Ion yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's a, it's a very very mm. nice piece where at least it gives the overview of the kind of contribution what mm. Vasant has. It is also uh, you know very very unfortunate that he's not here with us in in an era where quantum has become big quantum technology you know, yeah. i think he probably was the first person in india who really yeah w- one of the very a, few i mean right? handful of people not yeah. more yeah yeah it's a, it's, it's a very unfortunate but also the kind of legacy you know that is something i want to ask a little bit more over um i should also mention that i indirectly knew vasan mm-hmm. because uh, he had a friend in Bangalore University, Professor yes. Sharat Tanan. Yes, Postman. yes, yes. Yeah, they uh, were quite good friends. Good yes. friends. And uh, I was a student of Sharat. And, uh, ah, I, guess oh, okay. I was an <laughs> atomic molecular optical physics MSc yeah. student. Uh-huh. And we used to hear about not only Vasan, but also you, you uh, <laughs> okay. from Sharat. He okay. was mentioning that uh, they are doing setting up some very uh, remarkable experiments. Mm. And uh, I was a student, an MSc student during mm. that particular mm. time. And we used to hear a lot about uh, uh, how Vasant, as mm. you mentioned, is not mm. only very good with his hands, mm. but also uh, uh, is doing some remarkable work and has mm. very deep understanding with mm. various subjects. Uh, as a part of our own courses and other things, we were also learning a lot about, mm. you know, atom trapping mm. and other things. So, of course, it's a special paper with, where it also has connection to QED and other mm-hmm. kind of questions. Um, that is one thing which is quite remarkable because you know that formative years of how a person who is setting up the lab interacts with his or her uh, uh, students, especially the initial students. This is something we all have mm. gone through because even now, you know, of course, we all have graduated many students, mm. but still that connection and the kind of, you know, uh, the time you spent with the students inside the lab, setting mm. up, literally moving mm. the tables. I see on Facebook mm. the beautiful photograph mm. where you, Ayan and all mm. actually are moving the table mm. in the ISC building. Mm. Uh, that is a very important thing, mm. right? Because that phase is 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 neither uh, possible to be repeated either for the professor mm. or for the student. Mm. Right? Because right. It, it goes away. It's yes, very, yes. Very remarkable. I should tell one more thing yeah. about uh, Vasant. <coughs> when I just joined, we are supposed to choose courses from uh, n number of courses across the institute in IISC for the graduate coursework. So, I marked a few courses. As usual, mm. I, I wanted to take some experimental courses. To me, I thought, okay, it would be easy for me to sail through these courses. Mm. So, I went and showed him the courses to approve for him to approve the courses. He looked at me and said, you should always take such courses which you are never again going to see in your life again, study in your life. But that will remain in you forever, he said. And then, you know, what I ended up uh, choosing. (laughs) What uh, what he ended up giving, and I mean, yeah. between the two of us, we uh, we boiled down to courses like relativistic quantum mechanics <laughs> okay. and advanced statistical mechanics, mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> taught by again stalwarts yeah, yeah. and very complicated. <laughs> then, it, to me, when I looked at the course content, sounded very complicated. But by the time I went through the courses. I was pretty confident, I understood the courses yes. and I was not afraid of those complicated yeah. mathematics anymore. Precisely so, right. even now, I have this confidence that if I am given a such a course to teach, I can I prepare for a month or two and give a yeah. deliver a lecture, uh, deliver a lecture series on those courses, which is essential. See, that is the confidence of a good 
foundation mm -hmm. and that is the foundation probably will again connect you to your msc days mm -hmm. the the fact what you got even i also strongly feel because is, you know i also came through msc same you know mm -hmm. that rigorous hardcore mathematical mm -hmm. physics training really, you know <laughs> there again you know in bangalore university there were people who were like doing calculations after calculations <laughs> in quantum electrodynamics uh, and also high energy physics and other things but there was a very strong component and encouragement also to look at uh, uh, experimental physics and uh, i absolutely agree with you because you know that is probably one of the things which generally doesn't get highlighted when you're talking about experimental physics mm. i keep telling to some of my students when they really mm. ask me that experimental physics is equal to theoretical physics plus thinking with hands <laughs> right it's no. not just doing with hands yeah, it's not really exactly so because no we, without really having to uh, having uh, some basic knowledge of theoretical physics mm. you can't do experimental as you yeah. uh, as you clearly mentioned especially in physics yes it would be very difficult for one mm. to do this so uh, one more point i wanted to ask uh, umakan see you are also setting up some some very creative experiments that is something which i have heard and you also mentioned during our past conversations mm. uh, and uh, even i and when i talked to mm. him at some point of time mentioning that you three were actually kind of a team where mm. the initial uh, kind of mm. seed of mm. the lab and you were also you know using innovative methods mm. to do some experiments can you just tell a little bit about that time period how it was I know the funding was limited, mm. uh, but uh, what was the kind of thought process? I know you people were setting up some very interesting ring down kind of things also. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, unlike these days, when if you if you ask somebody to set up some experiments or if somebody wants to uh, set up some experiments to carry out some research, again. world is going moving very fast mm. in this field these days and if somebody has to set up these experiments and catch up with the world or even start producing some results which can be communicated in some uh, decent journals mm. it needs a lot of hard work to get this get these experiments up and running in spite of the technology being accessible Access like all the laser systems control systems everything these days is accessible in the sense you can just go and buy them out now assuming that you have funding and you get them it still takes a couple of uh, years uh. those days there was no way one can imagine that you could go and buy them it was given that you cannot buy any of this you have to build your own uh. and set up things that was something for us it was like a given, given fact given <laughs> so navigating through this process of building everything itself was the most exciting experience mm. and of course once you once your system starts working and when we saw the first cold atom strapped in the lab we were so excited forget about see, uh, seeing cold atoms when we first saw the fluorescence from room temperature vapor from a rubidium atoms uh, mm. vapor cell with lasers that we built we were so excited exactly. that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. so the learning process that those days people used to go through or we went through i think that process these days it's unfortunate people don't get the opportunity to mm. go through it mm. Mm. <coughs> yeah yeah true true that's something yeah. which is quite uh, remarkable also because uh, uh, i've heard also uh, so many of them people who have uh, had spent their time in isc during that time mm. always used to get confused uh, with wasant they thought he was either a postdoc because he used to come <laughs> on a cycle basically yes basically yeah. uh, i've heard so many people telling yes, me that yeah. that uh, they did not have an idea that he was actually a faculty <laughs> member, right he was yes. very young And yeah, uh, and uh, we all used to go together to the mess. Mess. Oh, okay. uh, so that was another reason why probably. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. So, uh, what was the main uh, PhD problem you worked on? Uh, so yeah, so Vasant when he joined, of course, he everything that he used to do and uh, wanted to do were difficult problems, mm -hmm. problems which would take decades to execute, to see results. so his biggest he had two three pet problems those days 
one of the one of his pet problem was to measure the permanent electric dipole moment of uh, um, electrons and neutrons okay nice so nice. this particular problem has uh, deep implications in uh, understanding the uh, charge parity mm. time reversal symmetry in nature, in nature yeah. Yeah. so it is said that if these particles possess electric dipole permanent electric dipole moment beyond a certain pre, uh, upper limit then standard model of you one has to think beyond the standard model of physics so that was the problem that he had mm. in his mind mm. the other problem that he had in his mind those days was to do loophole free bell's inequality tests mm. using uh, atomic systems now he i started off with the first problem of uh, this permanent electric dipole moment measurement but of course it was uh, he also knew and most of us knew that this problem is not going to be completed <laughs> even within the lifetime of 2 to 3 phd yes. students so we started off with the first step of achieving ultra cold uh, ytterbium atoms mm -hmm. now but as i mentioned ytterbium atoms okay uh, since we didn't have funding mm -hmm. it was hard to start with ytterbium atoms because those atoms need wavelengths of light which can only be generated by very large laser Lasers. systems which costed those days over a crore those days those days 1990s uh, late 90s uh, so we since we started off slow he decided to get a handle on the laser cooling part mm. so we chose to go with rubidium those days rubidium atoms are accessible with cheap diode mm. lasers yeah. so we built those lasers first we got the ultra cold rubidium atoms once we knew everything about uh, all the i mean once we as students knew about how to laser cool atoms measure their different uh, temperatures and densities etc by the time the funding had come which took already 4 years after 4 years when the funding came then we started building the ytterbium atom systems uh, laser cooling system and his idea was to use ytterbium atoms for measuring the permanent oh, electric yeah. dipole moment in ytterbium atoms now that project so during my phd i achieved laser cooling and trapping of rubidium and ytterbium atoms at the same time did a lot of experiments in uh, eit and mm -hmm. outlaw town yeah. splitting and precision uh, hyperfine spectroscopy in just vapor cells etc but the ytterbium system the problem of measuring the permanent electric dipole moment continued beyond uh, after my mm -hmm. after my phd another 2 3 phd's and finally he he could get a setup where he could measure at least uh, the precision of the electronic spin, spin right. in, in the presence of an applied and in the so precision of electronic spin in an atom in the presence of an external a applied Apply, high electric field. electric field okay so one needs to apply magnetic mm. and electric mm. fields to measure the very tiny electric dipole, dipole moment. moment up yes. to that point he had got in nice. another 15 years or so nice but then unfortunately mm. he is no more mm. so that those experiments would have continued and, now, and some results would have come out by now yeah interesting interesting so uh, then uh, you also probably uh, had uh, a, an interesting kind of an experience which you took from there and uh, then you know went to europe if i'm correct mm. can you tell about that transition how <laughs> where why <laughs> <laughs> yeah like all uh, phd students we look forward to doing a postdoc abroad mm. in of course all of us dream of doing postdoc in some of the best mm. labs mm. in the world no now those days during our phd still it was not over there used to be a lot of uh, indo french uh, scientists interaction through cefipra programs Cefipra program, between yeah. france and india in bangalore mm -hmm. so there used to be many people from paris who used to visit from the ecole normale superior mm -hmm. and other people so 
I got introduced to uh, Professor Madame Michelle Ledu, who mm. had visited mm. our lab, and she saw what all we were doing, and uh, she had proposed that if I am looking for a postdoc, I could think of their labs. Wow. Mm. So when I, as soon as I, just before I submitted my PhD, I wrote to them, and they said they offered me a postdoc position, and this was at Ecole Normale Supérieure in the center of Paris. In the group of uh, Professor Claude Cohen Tanoji. So, uh, listeners, uh, Claude Cohen Tanoji is one of the Nobel laureates mm. uh, and one of the pioneers, you mm. know, in laser atom interaction. Yes, yeah. and yeah. they they were the pioneers in developing optical pumping techniques and understanding various phenomena in this optically pumped systems. And he also has, uh, together with two more authors, has written a series of quantum mechanics books. The famous quantum mechanics mm. books, three Very volumes. Famous. Yeah. In fact, until even now, mm. it is probably one of the best textbooks, uh, including those who want to learn theory mm. and experiments. Because he himself, Cloud mm. himself, has mentioned that you mentioned in word intuition. Mm. In fact, it also keeps repeating in his his interviews. Mm. He also mentions that quantum mechanics actually needs a lot of intuition, mm. right? Of yeah. course, you know, subsequent beautiful experiment by Sergey Hroch and other, mm. other people also exactly mm. mentioned that. Yeah. So tell us about more more about that time. Yeah. So I went there and uh, I worked on this uh, complicated experiment on uh, measuring. Interaction cross section between two metastable helium atoms. Mm. Now, in the physics of ultra cold atoms, especially the physics of Bose Einstein condensate with ultra cold atoms, one of the things that's important to know is S wave scattering length. This is about uh, basically the how two atoms collide and they repel or mm. they attract each other and all that. Now, this parameter, the S wave scattering length was unknown for metastable helium atoms. Now, these metastable helium atoms are unlike uh, neutral atoms, rubidium, meterbium, or strontium, or cesium, or potassium. The atoms are actually, the electrons are excited to a metastable state where they live for a very, very long time. And then you spin polarize them and put them in a magnetic trap and then do the physics with it. So it's a very sophisticated uh, system. There were only two experiments at that time on metastable helium atoms, one in Professor uh, Claude Cohen-Tanoji's lab and one in uh, the lab of Alain Aspe. Hmm. And uh, these Who is two, the, one of the recent Nobel uh, <laughs> So these experiments were quite uh, sophisticated in the sense that it is very difficult to control these atoms. So they had achieved a Bose-Einstein condensate with these atoms, both of the groups. And the next challenging task was to measure this S-wave scattering length. Mm -hmm. So I work, worked on these experiments to measure the S-wave scattering length. Now, the way this S-wave scattering length is measured very precisely is through a two-photon transition from uh, states of two colliding atoms connecting to a least bound molecular state of these atoms when they come together. Mm -hmm. In the molecular well potential, the least bound state, which is the topmost level, you measure that energy difference and from there you can very precisely calculate the S wave scattering length. And uh, there, there were a lot of theoretical predictions on what should be the value of this S wave scattering length in the in units of what should be the binding energy of that least bound state. Now, in terms of spectroscopy, that meant searching for that very narrow transition line in a range of about 100 megahertz and you don't know where to look for and generating frequency difference uh, which you can change up to 100, 150 megahertz is very tricky business when you are trying to do these experiments by measuring the loss rate of atoms in a Bose-Einstein condensate. Mm -hmm. Now this experiment took a very, very long time because the theoretical predictions had a very large error margin. And experimentally finding that took us a very, very long time. I was I stayed there for close to two years, yet we could not find that transition line. So it was a very difficult uh, time for looking for this transition. So this is one more incident where I would like to bring in 
perseverance as one of the key things when you do research. One cannot give up. And after two years, of course, I what I had wanted to move on to something else, which uh, something new that I wanted to learn. So I moved to Innsbruck to working to work on uh, trapped ions based quantum computing. Mm -hmm. Now at uh, Paris, what they did was this. They again struggled for another year or two until they found the transition line. And this time it was possible because the theoretical models were uh, refined and new techniques were suggested for looking for this line. And hence they could find that line, the transition line. The binding, they could measure the binding energy of the least bound uh, level in the molecular potential. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So, uh, it also means that it's a very labor intensive uh, experiment because you will have to really, you know, do this by setting up a lot of... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, for instance, I mean, on any of these experiments, more than half a day goes in setting... Those days, hmm. used to go in setting up the lasers, getting all the lasers online, ensuring the, that the vacuum is right, ensuring that all the parameters are right for getting the hmm. condensate. So, those days it used to take more than half a day used to go and we used to get many times we used to just keep doing aligning and optimizing the system day after day without actually doing a particular measure without actually getting into measuring what we wanted to do mm -hmm. so it is quite intense uh, work work, uh, work yeah. that one needs to get into same thing used to happen in Innsbruck where i worked on uh, uh, this calcium ion trap yeah. based quantum computer there also, the issue was those days technology was not very robust in terms of laser systems and all. These days, it's much easier, much easier because yeah. those days you spend half a day to get all the lasers in mm -hmm. under control. These days, you within half an hour, you get all the lasers under control. So, technology has moved on a lot. So, yeah. It's re very interesting. It mm. also means that uh, you are getting trained from people who are really doing the cutting edge mm. uh, because the kind of problems what you're talking about even today they actually are still mm. contemporary research problems it's not like it's a yeah uh, with different systems which are different systems yeah and the uh, the application aspect of using it in quantum computation is still an open challenge yeah and uh, because of the fact that it's not a straightforward thing you have to really do a lot of interesting kind of important uh, assimilation of resources and, and also knowledge. Hmm. So, how was it uh, working with uh, Koen Tanuji? Uh, and oh, it was fantastic again in the sense that, uh, I mean, I must say I was privileged to work with hmm. all these people. Hmm. So, whenever he used to come to the lab, he used to spend a lot of time <laughs> with us and he knew that this experiment is actually taking a lot of hmm. effort to get this signal hmm in the experiment. So, he used to come and he used to give a lot of motivational Motivation. speeches <laughs> and he used to get really deep into all the problems that we were facing mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. So, that was quite motivational which mm -hmm. used to keep us uh, really in high spirits to keep pursuing mm -hmm. to the problem. The problem. Yeah. It's a, it's very important. Yeah. Very yeah. Important. yeah. Uh, you know, I, I haven't of course met him but I whatever I've uh, read and heard mm -hmm. uh, including some of the lectures and all he's mm -hmm. He's a master, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, like, if we had not understood some basic physics uh, <laughs> issues there, we would obviously, since we are uh, struggling daily, we would sit with him and he used to explain these things so lucidly, lucidly. Yes. without getting into deep uh, mathematics yes. again. Yes. Then you would know what is going on. What is going exactly. On. Of course, it come. It automatically comes from the maths, but he the physics the, that's going on yeah. behind it, he would know it just yeah. like anything yeah in fact that is one thing uh, which i also find uh, reading is textbooks uh -huh. you know it's a very, it's a two volume book by the way it's not a small book but there are so many important uh, discussions in yeah. there and uh, that is uh, quite remarkable some of because of the fact that quantum mechanics books generally are taught from a slightly more theoretical viewpoint because calculations and other things are important this book somehow doesn't get much attention it deservingly requires more. I know people who work on quantum optics read this book quite a lot. No, it used to be popular during our MSc. MSc. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That was popular in our university. Yeah. 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 
yeah in fact wherever you do uh, amop mm. kind of things this book is very very well mm. branson and jochang mm. <laughs> and claude uh, mm. tanuji's uh, mm. uh, uh, books so now uh, you are already gaining knowledge you have really picked up very important techniques and also uh, the kind of uh, fundamental research problems mm. uh, and you are now looking towards india mm. again mm. Why are you looking? Because you literally worked with who's who in the field, so, and uh, what made you to even look towards India? And no, uh, I it? always wanted to come back. <laughs> I, there was no question that I was going to settle abroad. I wanted to come back and pursue research and do something for India. So I, <laughs> I, I that was that was not a question. That was not a question. So, I after Paris, I spent just one more year in uh, Innsbruck. working on uh, quantum computing with trapped ions then i moved back to india when i moved to india of course i mean it was pretty challenging to find a job in academic positions so mm. i had applied many places i had not heard from them for over a year and all that mm. so i was getting a bit uh, frustrated with the kind of response that i was getting obviously those days uh, in 2005 there were not so many iits and there were no icers that mm, time mm, so mm. naturally there were only a very few institutions, institutions which yeah. i can imagine that the intake was slow at that mm. time so since we had to come back to india because of family reasons also i went and joined industrial research and development in bangalore with a big uh, american uh, company where ji ha general electrics yeah. that's where it yeah is. and uh, there of course i mean though it was uh, not fundamental research it mm. was an applied mm. research it was still uh, cutting edge research mm. that i was doing so that way i was uh, happy with what i was doing but still somewhere down inside me i thought of doing fundamental physics mm. and uh, kind of academic research so <coughs> i moved to i sir i said how long did you spend in ge <coughs> about 4 uh, years 4 years yeah little less than 4 years yeah yeah and uh, see that is also one of the very good things because uh, you have an industrial experience mm. you also know the pipelines mm. and the uh, priorities and also the viewpoints which mm. they bring in which is equally important right. especially for an experimental researcher it's a very valuable experience. yeah it it come it mm. helps you when you are thinking about translating your research mm. to something useful see at the end of the day whatever whether we do so called applied physics or fundamental physics some day it is going to come to use mm. to humanity mm. Mm. it may be a fundamental research today but Absolutely. maybe 50 years down the line that is going to be important and there are umpteen number of examples, examples. in the history right? in yes. history right Absolutely. some things which you just do <laughs> for pursuing, lasers <laughs> uh, lasers for example something that you do just for academic uh, pursuit they turn out to be of extreme value to humanity yes. at some point so i would say i mean applied research or basic physics it doesn't matter but what you it this experience of industry comes in handy to look for translating your research to something, something useful else. in the short term not all problems can be translated into applied uh, i mean some applications yeah. immediately but some of them can be as an experimentalist you uh, on a regular basis you keep developing certain things which you think that which you may not if you don't think about translation you will it will just remain in your lab and gets forgotten mm-hmm. but if you have this translational bent of mind you can bring them to use mm-hmm. either i mean it's up to an individual to take it whether to make uh, monetary benefits out of it or not but it will be of some use some at use. the end of it absolutely yeah, yeah. so now uh, you make a transition from uh, ge to icer uh, 2009 Okay. Yeah, in two thousand nine, I joined ICER. Yeah, and I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> so you also built a very very nice lab. Uh, in fact, I have seen literally from scratch mm. building because uh, we all actually a car coming from similar mm. basket, mm. <laughs> so to speak. Mm. And uh, I also see that there is tremendous amount of effort, time, knowledge, which has been invested in that particular thing. Mm. How how uh challenging was it makan because see that culture of building a cutting edge quantum optics or atomic physics especially when you 
you you also showed that you could actually uh, realize bosons in condensate uh, which is one of the remarkable achievements uh, in that sense it's not also an easy thing to do because you literally started from an it lab <laughs> foundational mm-hmm. space then moved to the new building yeah, tell so, us a little bit about the, the challenges see i mean coming from the kind of background mm-hmm. i came from in the sense that from iisc mm-hmm. in paris in innsbruck mm. and even in g mm. everywhere okay in paris i didn't set up so much of experiment but i set up a part mm. some parts of it everywhere i have set up a new experiment or a lab mm. and it is it's become a kind of a way of life right. so when you have to do something you set up from scratch and do it so that way i was not um uh, intimidated by the feeling that i have to set up a new lab mm. so that was never the case so it was not difficult that way to think of setting up a lab at that late period especially i mean i came into academia slightly later than what normally mm. other people mm. do because i spent four additional mm. years yes. in industrial r and d it was it was not challenging in the sense that okay I mean, it was not intimidating to mm. think of setting mm. up a lab so that part was kind of already sorted out mm. but setting up itself is challenging in different was challenging in different ways because when i joined here obviously i mean i was alone and then i had a couple of students which essentially means that we all have to work together in yeah, the absolutely. lab and they have to learn from what i know in setting up things so that took couple of years, years yeah. and fortunately that time uh, the funding was generous mm-hmm. in iser so i had no difficulty in getting started. getting started mm-hmm. and also those days uh, the procurement procedures were mm-hmm. uh, more relaxed yeah. than what mm-hmm. it is now so things could be procured faster and i could set up the lab of course i mean it was uh, it was quite exciting to exciting feeling to see that you are actually training a new generation of students okay so by the time i finished setting up my experiment and got the first signal of uh, the bose einstein condensate in my lab there were already 3 4 students who had who also knew how to do this so that was a great feeling so the knowledge kind of got transferred, yeah. transferred to many more people so that was quite exciting for me that's a very important point what yeah. you're making mm-hmm. so um tell us a little bit about the kind of problems your lab has been working on in mm-hmm. in in over the years and uh, what kind of questions you are interested in give us a flavor of the research yeah. what is going on right mm-hmm. so i have uh, three experimental platforms two of them are with ultra cold atoms and one with uh, trapped ions mm-hmm. so the first one is the oldest one with rubidium atoms where we can produce uh, atoms at temperatures up to 100 nano kelvins meaning you can either uh, work with the bose einstein condensate which is a quantum phase of the condensed atoms is a it's a giant matter wave mm. or you can work with very cold thermal atoms above the transition temperature <laughs> now <clears throat> using both bose einstein condensate and thermal atoms we have been studying the physics of anderson localization mm. in solid state systems as i said earlier the that, simulation part <laughs> uh, the simulation <laughs> part so you mm. use an analog system to simulate some other system in a different context so this is an example where we used ultra cold atoms in what is called as an atom optic kick drotter system mm-hmm. which is a model system of a kick drotter to simulate the dynamics of anderson localization and also using the same model we have uh, studied things like controlling decoherence mm-hmm. how all quantum systems decohere exponentially, exponentially most of the times but uh, is there a way to control this decoherence so that it stays longer so one of the things we did was to engineer the thermal bath to which these atoms coupled to and make this decoherence prolonged mm-hmm. 
and actually not follow an exponential decay but follow a power law. So this was done in collaboration with one of my colleagues, Santana. Santana, yes, yes. And also we are looking at uh, localization, Anderson localization with the same system with Bose-Einstein condensate. Mm. So this is some physics problems that we are looking at. Mm. On the technology side, using the Bose-Einstein condensate itself, we have done a technology demonstration of uh, instrument using atom interferometry. Mm. Mm to measure gravitational acceleration with a high degree of precision. Now, as you know, I mean, because of just the wave particle duality, mm. whatever light can do, even mm. particles, particles can do the same thing. Yeah. So that's the fundamental principle in using atoms for uh, interferometer. Mm. So what we do is we make an interferometer, Mark Zemter interferometer with giant matter waves. Yeah, and we measure the phase shift that the matter wave packets pick up when they are falling under gravity and measure the gravita gravitational acceleration with a very high degree of precision. This is a known thing. We just did a technology demonstration. demonstration. Nice. Now we are building a more compact and portable system which can be used in the field for various applications. applications. Nice. So that is one that is the rubidium atom mm -hmm. system. Yeah. And we are also trying to do some simulation of one dimensional uh, Bose Hubbard models mm. and things like that in some modified potentials. So that those problems are going on right mm. now. The second system that we have is a neutral strontium, strontium atom system. Now strontium atoms are very interesting because uh, one of the transitions, optical transition in strontium is uh, electric dipole forbidden transition. Mm. It's extremely narrow the lifetime of that excited state is in the millihertz regime. So the line width is way, way smaller than one hertz. Mm. Now, if this transition frequency can be measured very precisely, that can be used as an optical atomic Auto clock. Plot. So many groups around the world are developing these optical atomic clocks, not only with strontium, but some other systems also, because most probably sometime in the next decade or so, the definition of second will be based upon optical frequencies instead of micro instead of the current microwave frequency standard of, uh, of a hyperfine transition in cesium atoms. The yes, other line yes. of research on this strontium is, uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, is about coupling the uh, strontium atoms to plasmoid Plasm nanostructures mm -hmm. to mimic a cavity QVD system to get into a strong coupling regime mm -hmm. wherein information quantum information from the photon emitted by the atom can be transferred to plasmonic excitations now this system can work as a node in quantum information processing not only as a quantum repeater but also as a, uh, a node for scaling up the number of qubits in a system so that is the second problem that is that is going on nice. on the strontium atomic system Nice. The third the system which we have just recently started setting up is a calcium ion trap, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. which is uh, geared towards uh, making a string of more than 20 ions for doing quantum computing. Now we have trapped ions in the trap and we are in the process of laser cooling the ions to get uh, linear crystals of these ions. Nice. nice. Yeah. So it's a so linear array, right? Yeah, it will be a linear array. So, Gumakan, this is a very beautiful description and also so logically very well put where you have rubidium, strontium mm. and the calcium ions. Mm. In the first two cases, it's neutral atom mm. process. So, just for a sake of getting a little bit more broader, what motivated you to choose these problems, uh, especially if some young student or even it can be a new group which is starting, they should know how to <clears throat> pick, pick problems uh, and what is, what is your rationale of picking problems? Okay. The rational for my first experiment, which has been there since I joined mm. the institute, was to do challenging mm. thing. And making a Bose-Einstein condensate to me was one of the mm. challenging yeah, yeah. tasks in this field of research. Of course, I knew that there are many, many problems, <coughs> physics problems that can be explored with the Bose-Einstein condensate, like simulating many mm. body physics and uh, doing matter wave optics, etc. 
at that time my focus was only about getting solving the most difficult part yeah. of the problem and that is producing the bose einstein condensate nice, nice. today this is the only system in the country mm. which uh, produces the bose einstein condensate mm. so that challenging problem is what motivated okay. me to choose that problem nice. it has to be hard it mm. has to be challenging so that you basically reach the limits of any technology that you would like to use uh, that goes into mm. building that otherwise to me personally mm. there is no point in of course i mean there are a lot of physics problems that you can do with uh, less sophistication but to me it it had to be both it had to be challenging physics problems plus technique technology techni technology wise technology challenging, challenging because there are so many things you learn you get excitement when you are doing things when they work so that was a very nice motivation fantastic fantastic this see this also is very very interesting because uh, as an outsider uh, if you look at this particular community where atomic physics and quantum optics mm. both come into picture mm. uh, the there is a nice community of researchers mm. which actually are uh, very interactive and also there is a very good exchange of ideas i i am not very outside into that because mm. i also know a lot of mm. people because uh, because of mm. common interests and uh, mm. some common problems and other things uh, each sub disciplines of physics have their own culture mm -hmm. okay and uh, you know the good thing about this particular community is very strongly driven by experimental mm. groups because even there are theoreticians who are hosted inside an experimental group mm. and the experiments are, uh, mm. kind of are driven Mm. and it's like it happens in very very large groups mm. many a times right what is it as a typical kind of a, 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 an experience of such kind of community can you give us a little bit of flavor how it is to interact with such people yeah. what do you so learn? i mean uh, strictly speaking in india the community is pretty small, small. yeah yeah so maybe 10 researchers mm. and uh, all of us it's very challenging even otherwise to do these kind of experiments mm -hmm. because of uh, various non scientific factors mm -hmm. so the community is kind of closely knit because uh, we all go through difficult mm -hmm. situations mm -hmm. and it is important for us to remain together mm -hmm. it so happens that many times you may have, i mean like simple things like borrowing a simple mm -hmm. optic mm -hmm. which can stall your experiment or all together at that level the interaction goes on and now of course i mean uh, it's a closed knit community mm. i would say nice. largely speaking yeah nice nice you also brought up an important point of the fact that in india generally there is no critical threshold of people and many times when you want these kind of big projects to actually happen you need a lot of people because then you can also get feedback exchange of uh, information yeah. resources etc mm. uh in what direction do you think indian uh, research community per se can uh, you know uh, assist uh, to break to bring this because you know at the heart of quantum uh, computation or any kind of quantum technologies to emerge this community actually has to be really you know uh, fostered mm. it has to also be you know uh, supported uh there should also be more number of people who should be able to do this kind of stuff yeah the problem is mm. the number of people is very less mm. Mm. because uh, most people who go abroad mm. you see first of all the number of groups is less yes. the number of phd's in all compared to other fields produced is very less and assuming the uh, most of them go abroad mm. for a postdoc for global experience and what not of which the small returning thing. fraction can be small, small. Mm. and other problem is uh, getting positions getting hired is also a big challenging task in our field because the number of publications that come out in our field of research is at a very slow rate yeah. because uh, it takes many many years to set up the experiment mm. Mm. it takes couple of years to actually for some physics to come out oh, yeah. and if you are working on a new physics problem it takes another few years yes. so the number of publications that come out 
is pretty low. Yeah. Mm. So when these people stand in competition mm. for jobs mm. Mm. in different departments across the country, that is the biggest yes. drawback mm. that they face mm. Mm. compared to other fields. So that is a challenging task for increasing the number of people in this area. You have made a very important point. Mm. See, that is always a question, right? It's not only with across different disciplines, mm. it is also within sub-disciplines, mm. as you correctly mentioned. Mm. And uh, somehow this encouragement, because see, there is no way uh, one would be able to uh, bring in this quantum technologies without this important element. See, mm. there are of course other parts of it, but this is actually one of the foundational kind of yes. uh, areas. Yes. And, uh, I, I mean, atomic physics and quantum, quantum optics is the founding stone for all the quantum technologies that is coming up. I mean, all the, the quantum technology buzz across the world has been created because of this particular field, mm -hmm. the achievements in this field and what it can offer. Absolutely. Yeah. See, in fact, if you look at some classic books, textbooks, especially on quantum mechanics, mm. the test of quantum mechanics mm. actually is optical. Yes. Majority of them. Yes. Of course, there are also many which have followed mm. in recent times. But the traditionally, if you look at it, even the at the outset, it was the spectroscopy, which mm. really brought in the core elements of quantum mechanics. Because without really looking at the lines and hyperfine lines, yeah. etc., there would be no way you would be able to verify yeah. your quantum mechanics. AMO physics is yeah. definitely a, has been at the forefront. forefront. And AMO physics has been the driver for all this quantum mm. Technologies buzz, buzz that has been created across the world. Absolutely, absolutely. It's some something very, very important mm. what you're mentioning. Yeah. So if somebody who is uh, higher up there <laughs> listening to this, mm. I we request you to mm. encourage more AM physics. Mm. <laughs> no, this is just a humble kind yeah, of a, yeah. a request because you know I I am a I'm a MSc student of AMO. You know I. Uh -huh. The reason why I've been able to do whatever I'm doing is because of that fundamental training. Uh -huh. That is remarkable, right? Because you actually can do optics and atomic or molecular physics, uh, be it even at a uh, scale of, let's say, single molecule. Even biology actually has hugely benefited mm. from this viewpoint. As you, yes. at the beginning of this podcast, you correctly mentioned mm -hmm. uh, that also has a very important motivation to bring in and uh, do a lot of interesting yeah. things. So we are now going to actually, you know, uh, make it a little bit more, uh, you know, lighter. Mm. <laughs> uh, now that uh, you have uh, given us a very, very nice overview of your research and also your thoughts on mm. some Indian uh, science and other things. Uh, there is one segment I generally request my, my uh, guests uh, to speak a few sentences in their mother tongue about uh, their motivations and why they are doing what they are doing and uh, other things. So uh, it is a uh, it, it is also an important thing for uh, students to get motivated uh, in listening to you in your own mother tongue. Yeah, Pawan. Since you asked me, I'll be very very brief. I'll speak one sentence in two languages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you are very very conversant <laughs> in two languages. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, which is Telugu and Marathi. Yeah, yeah. So, mala physics karne madhe khub anand milto. Na ko physics che sutlo chala anandam dilke Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. That's very good. See, that, that that's a, uh, what he is mentioning. You can also translate in English, please. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of doing physics. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. That's uh, that's an important uh, yeah. thing. So, anybody who actually can understand those languages, I hope you'll you'll get the yeah. message. There's a lot of joy in doing doing science. So mm -hmm. take that as an important message. So we are almost uh, coming to the end, uh, Makat. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you relax. You also have a fantastic dog at home. <laughs> you know, it's one of my favorite dogs. Yeah. You so, know, and uh, <laughs> what do you do in your free time? How do you relax? What is your uh, kind of uh, kind of relaxation uh, process? Please of course, please. I mean these days there is no time to relax. <laughs> but uh, I do enjoy my morning and evening walk yeah. with our dog, mm. and uh, go cycling many times, far distance. Well, uh, not so far distances, but at least for an hour and a half or so, which gives me time to think and reflect on myself while I am enjoying the natural beauty in the uh, in the western part of Pune. <laughs> because we just have to ride 10 kilometers out and we are in the in nature, nature here. So yeah. that's kind of relaxing because it gives a complete one and a half to two hours of 
time to completely rethink, re, I mean, reflect upon yourself, uh, think about ideas and all that. So, so you carry your cycle in on your car? No, I I uh, take it from home and oh, you directly uh, I directly through the it. traffic. Yeah, no, no, early morning. Early so morning. Sorry. I just ride into the uh, um, wilderness. Uh, wilderness. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So that's a way of relaxing as well as uh, thinking deeper things. Nice, nice. So uh, before we end, what are your kind of uh, immediate plans, future in terms of research? And any other activities you have thought about and everything? Uh, about research, <clears throat> I would like to not only pursue some of the basic physics problems, I would like to make something that is useful immediately for the society out of the work that I am doing. So there are a couple of things that I have in mind which can be of direct use for the entire society in different things. So. Yeah, I should mention that Umakant, in collaboration with Sunil Nair, played a very critical role during the COVID times. Mm. They also actually had a working ventilator, mm. uh, which also was actually taken to a very uh, kind of advanced level in terms mm. of its uh, design, development, etc. And uh, there's a lot of information also available online. So, yeah, uh, that's good, Umakant. That's yeah. one of the very interesting things uh, uh, about your work. Although you have such important fundamental questions to address in the lab, you also have a very good footing in, in uh, 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 work which can be translated. Mm. Again, all, it again goes back all the way <laughs> to the connection what you had during mm. your uh, childhood. Mm. Maybe that is also a motivation. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, thank, so thanks a lot, Pawan, for uh, mm -hmm. uh, speaking with me. And uh, first time I'm speaking openly <laughs> like this yeah. about my entire trajectory. No, it's yeah. a pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah. Umakant, as as I mentioned, is my colleague. So we have had various interactions. I have learnt a lot from Umakant, and I I, I look forward to. Of learning. course, I learnt a lot from you too. Yeah, yeah, we all learn from mutual, each other. It's a mutual. It's a mutual thing, including our labs. Mm. You know, by the way, our first students were the, from the same batch. Ah, <laughs> so right. Learned ah, I see. And uh, so we started our labs almost yes, simultaneously yes, yes, in yes. that sense. So thank you, Umakan. Yeah, Th thanks, thanks a lot for, yeah. for your time. Thank you. So this is Pratidwani, where we try to humanize science, this time with one and only Umakan <laughs> Rapol. Thank you.